Hey guys, it's Otti again. Um, I'm sitting here in an online call with Andy Cairns from Therapy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Anne. Um, it's an honor for me because I know your band, I think, for 30 years now or something like that. And um, we now talk about your new album, but uh, let's first have a short throwback to 2020. Mm -hmm. Release the greatest hits album shortly mm -hmm. before the pandemic break, uh, broke out. So how did this influence uh, the, the things after the release of greatest hits? Well, we had a huge year planned of work, of many shows, festivals. Yeah. Um, that, like everybody else in the world, that, that all had to be stopped. But we decided we had a Zoom meeting very quickly with the band. And we said, well, let's just write another album now because we don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. we'll, and we'll write it remotely so we would have zoom conversations we would send each other uh, music files over the internet of ideas and we kept on going and kept on going and eventually we had about 22 songs and then whenever the first lockdown was lifted we were able to meet up and have a, a four-day rehearsal then there was a second lockdown, we wrote more songs. And um, by the time that lockdown was lifted, we had the songs that we needed for the album and we were ready to rehearse them. So that way it kept us focused and stopped us from getting depressed about the fact we couldn't tour or play music. Yeah. Uh, was it the first time you used internet for songwriting communication? The first time we'd used it this intensively. I mean, in the past, it's only really been Michael or Neil might have an idea uh, and they'll send me a track and go, do you think this would work live or do you think this would work in a track? But never for whole songs. But this way we would, uh, Michael is very good with technology. So I would have an idea for a song and I would record it on my phone with headphones on a click track and send him a very rough version. And he would put it into his computer and he would add the bass and then he would quantize it so it was in time and send that to Neil Cooper, the drummer. And then they would send all that back to me and I would sing over the top of it. And we did this many times again and again and again <laughs> to see how things would work. Yeah. It's, I think for, uh, it was a little bit, or it was good that the pandemic happened when all this uh, technical stuff was set up 20 years ago. You couldn't have done it like this. No, 20 years ago, what, what would we have done? Sent cassettes via the mail? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> take a modem and wait uh, 20 hours to set, yeah. uh, upload one track yeah 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 cool um, and all this uh, led to the new album mm -hmm. it's uh, I think I will always uh, change the words hard cold fire is uh, the right word uh, mm, that's right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it mm -hmm. could be that I uh, say for example cold hard water or something like this <laughs> quite funny um, but uh, I don't often ask for titles but in this case I think it's a metaphor for something so maybe you can Tell about that a little bit. Yeah, it's actually from a poet from Ireland mm -hmm. uh, called Louis McNeese, L-O-U-I-S-M-A-C-N-E-I-C-E. -E. And he is, um, he's dead now, but he was originally from East Antrim in Belfast. Uh, it was the same area that myself and Michael were from. And um, before even the music was written, I was reading about, I, I like some of his poetry. And he described the difference between uh, people in the north of the country and the people in the south of the country, because in the north it's colder. And he said, um, people in the north have a hard, cold fire. And it's if, you, if you're from Miss, uh, Ireland, like myself and Michael are, we have always found that people from where we live in uh, East Antrim, have got a very strong resilience. Now in this poem, Louis McNeese talks about the basalt, which is a rock that is found predominantly in County Antrim where we live. And also the mica, M-I-C-A, which is a type of mineral. And he said that people in the North are like made of this basalt and mica, so it makes them stronger. So we we like that because uh, he, he's, he was from the same area as myself and Michael. And we thought, okay, so, Hard Cold Fire, and it's also, it's a great rock title, isn't it? It's a great title for rock. I'm like, Hard Cold Fire! So um, we, uh, we kind of decided that was the title. This is before we'd written any music. So we had a, in our rehearsal room, we had the whiteboard, 
you know, that we get our ideas on. It's mm -hmm. just a hard, cold fire at the top. Oh, cool. So maybe this uh, was a red line you always had in mind, the title, and why you uh, wrote the songs? Well, the, the, the influence? Yeah, I think that the, the album was always going to be called uh, Hard Cold Fire, but also it was during the pandemic when people needed to show strength to survive, mm -hmm. uh, to get through, and to, a mental strength to just make sure that they they didn't despair and feel upset and sad. Uh, and that also thought about therapy as a band that's been around this is our 16th album we've been around over three decades we've seen everything come and go but we've managed to keep going so i think that was kind of part of the spirit of therapy when we made when we made this album was the hard cold fire yeah. Yeah, it's funny um the name therapy also says uh somehow about uh, mental health and stuff mm -hmm. so this is a topic you always have in your music i think so the, well, mind, it... the mindset of people I think so because it's something that's always fascinated all of us. Right. And as we've gotten older, we've realized that whenever we grew up as kids in North of Ireland, we didn't realize at the time how much impact the political situation had on us because we were born into this situation. We'd never known anything different. But it was a divided country with a divided mental attitude. And a lot of people in the north of Ireland had mental health problems because of the political situation. Um, people had um, post-traumatic stress disorder about having to live in separate communities. Now, we didn't really know these terms. I mean, I, I'm 57 years of age. So whenever I grew up, we didn't really have terms for things like that. Yeah. And we were very old school. So if you were depressed, it was like, come on, lift yourself up, get, get on with your day. No time for, for tears. It was very like this. But uh, we've always been fascinated by how people deal with life and how they express themselves. And certainly in a lot of therapy songs, like Trigger Inside, Going Nowhere, it's about people that have no place to express themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the good thing is all of this has changed. Nowadays, you can talk about your mental issues. You can go to a a doctor and say okay i have problems in my mind and you are not like uh 30 years ago where people said oh lift your head up yes that's right yeah and, and it's a good thing uh i just think it's my my wife she works in care with uh people that are vulnerable uh refugees people that are very young drug addicts homeless people and there's in i don't know it's maybe different in germany but in in the uk it's so so difficult people are lost in the system and uh, she always says that um, people are just two paychecks away from being homeless you know two missed paychecks away uh, and the amount of people that have really good lives that maybe they get a divorce they lose a job and next thing they're living on people's uh, couches sofas and then they, they end up in the streets so it's terrifying in the west in the 21st century that we can still have that on such a huge scale <laughs> And it's, I think uh, some things even get worse, like, for example, uh, through Brexit, uh, the situation in Britain has changed, as far as I can see, to the worse, not to the better. Well, yeah, Brexit's bullshit. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously Irish, but my wife's English. Mm -hmm. I've lived here, I've lived in England for 20 years. And I've, until Brexit, I never had any problems. People accept me. It was, it was what it was. It was England. It was a, a great country. And after brexit it, it divided the country in two to people that wanted to remain in europe or to people that wanted to be old-fashioned and, and right-wing and i grew up as i mentioned in ireland it was a very divided country so just as i had kind of moved to england and, and got a life and had a family all of a sudden i'm seeing my new home become just like ireland was people are fighting with each other and at the minute in britain there's so much anger And I think also there's a part of the British mentality of the people on the right wing that lie to themselves. They have mythologies. Now they see the, Brit the British Empire and Britain not as it is today, but this rosy way that it was many, 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 many years ago. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine said something interesting. There's a... I don't know how the phrase would translate into German, but a lot of older right-wing people would say, it was much better in my day. 
you know, in my day, the country was better, the streets were cleaner. My friend said, the point is, it wasn't better in your day. You were better in your day because you were younger. You had more energy. You had more vitality. You had more life. So everything seemed better. But the crime rates were through the roof. There was poverty. No one could get any employment. So it wasn't better. This myth that you have in your head that never existed. Yeah, sure. And I think it's, uh, for example, you as a Northern Irish um, guy, you know how hard it was with uh, IRA and all the terror and the, mm -hmm. the fightings you had. And this, for example, changed to the better. I think it's uh, you don't have to be afraid to have a bomb around every day. So, yeah, so, no, but whenever we were kids, there was terrorist organizations on the British side and on the Irish side. Yeah. And the city center used to close at six o'clock in the evening. Now, in Belfast city center, there was British army. Um, do you know when you go to a soccer, a football game, you go through turnstiles? Imagine the city center had a ring of steel with turnstiles because there were so many explosions. Yeah. Yeah, the IRA or would, would blow up shops. So in the evening, there was nowhere to go for people. So uh, there was a few concert halls just outside this ring. So when we were kids, we would only get, that, that was the one thing that brought us together. And therapy was never about division because the band has always had a, one Protestant, one Catholic, and the original drummer had mixed parents. So we were kind of, that was our political statement. And we were friends. We were really good friends. But to see it happen in England is, it's got, the country's so angry, but not in a, anger can be fantastic. As John Lydon said, anger is an energy. But at the minute, it's toxic. It's really, really toxic. Um, and there's um, a lot of people telling lies. Do you know what you know? It's like the big catchphrase. It's a bit like Donald Trump. Mm. This is my truth. So I, I could say to you, what is this I'm holding up? And you'll go, it's a pair of glasses. It's spectacles. And I will go, no, this is a bicycle. And you'll go, no, Andy, it's a pair of glasses. And I go, it's a bicycle. This is my truth. This is a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> and so we live in a post-truth world here in England. Nobody, nobody accepts any truth anymore. And, and, Growing up in a divided country like Northern Ireland, I, I just want there to be truth and clarity. And it's not difficult, but it, people make it difficult. Yeah, it's, I think it's in the whole world. Uh, it changes a bit with uh, all these fake news with people who think uh, their truth is, is, mm. uh, is a truth. Like, for example, uh, you know, when people say science uh, or science says it is like that, most scientists mm -hmm. say it's like that. And people say, no, I don't believe. Like climatic change, for example, doesn't exist. Yeah. It's always uh, I, I don't understand how people can be so egoistic, for example. Yeah. Yes, I agree with you on the climate change thing. I mean, even even my father, I've had to talk to my father because he was of the he's in his he's eighty four now, yeah. and he was of the opinion that climate change is just a myth. And I would go and I say to him, "Why would people say this?" And he said, "Oh, they just don't want people." Uh, we're having factories anymore like when I was when I was young I was going no it is it exists and I said you know do you not realize how cold it gets and how in in the summertime it's getting warmer but I don't know I think people are very selfish a lot of people in the human race are very selfish and they're not around on this planet for a very long time and as long as they're okay which is a pity because I I, I like to think and as does Michael and Neil in therapy the majority of people are very good and i do think that i think that people are good genuinely but as we all know i mean think back to when you were at school or even if it, it only takes one or two people to cause trouble you can be we me and you could be at a party there could be 40 people at the party going to see a gig and we're all having a good time and two assholes turn up and start and start causing trouble and those two people could ruin the entire evening for everybody And I think that that's what it feels like at the minute, the toxicity that's it's around the world. Yeah, it's, I have often discussions with my girlfriend about it uh, because she's always uh, afraid of the bad news and the people outside are all getting worse, she says. And I say, it's still, it is a minor, minority. It's not mm -hmm. the majority which does the stupid stuff. It's a minority. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's uh, what you meant, that two people yeah. uh, on... 10, for example, can win an evening. Yes. Yeah, that, that's right, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Funny thing, we uh, just got totally away from the album, but all these things, uh, how do they influence your songwriting? So are there some of the topics we talked about that went onto the new album? And so... Yes, I mean, talking about Division, there is a song on the album called Mongrel. Uh, Mongrel, you know, it's um, it's how we always felt growing up in the north of Ireland because we weren't British, we weren't Irish, we were this strange creature that was Northern Irish. So I lived in Ireland all my life, but I grew up in a Protestant family that was saw itself as part of, the, of Britain. But whenever I came over to Britain for the first time and people heard me speak, they said, that guy's Irish. <laughs> yeah. But whenever I, I would go to the south of Ireland because I had a Northern Irish accent, I would go to the south of Ireland and they would go, that guy's British because he's from the north of the country. So we didn't really know what we were. We were this kind of strange hybrid and that kind of carried with me. So the song Mongrel is about that. And there's a song on the album about the climate change we've just talked about called The Bewildered Herd, which is how, what are we going to do? Because everything's on fire, do I watch it burn and distract myself in the bewildered herd? And it's almost like, as you, as you very, very well mentioned earlier on, we do know climate change is this but everyone's turning away. We're distracting ourselves like a herd of cattle. Like uh, we're just, oh, look, this is a reality show on television. <laughs> you know, there, there's, oh, wow, there's something, there's, there's some really nice fast food we can have, you know, and, and nobody cares. It's, it's a Western thing. It only really happens in the West. But um, that's where the bewildered herd. It's easier just to follow everybody else and, and pretend you don't hear or say anything. Um, and the first song on the album, um, they shoot the terrible master. We, when we were writing this album, we found out that even though there was peace in Ireland, the suicide rates among young men have got uh, really, really high. I mean, the highest they've ever been. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was strange to people, myself and Michael's age and what we grew up with. We thought, well, this would, this was meant to be the generation of hope, mm -hmm. but people are finding all kinds, and we think it's like part of a post-traumatic stress disorder that their parents suffered. So that song looks at that. Yeah, so that they, they have carried over a lot, uh, some of those themes that we've talked about. Yeah, cool. Yeah, the Truth of Terrible Master, it's a great song. It, it uh, starts really powerful, or is a really powerful starting for the album. I was yeah. catched from the beginning, and this oh, is wow. what I like about your music as well, that... You have some smoother stuff, but uh, you have many powerful, energetic songs that still have the deep lyrics. Oh, thank you. Just, just party songs. You don't have party songs like other bands yeah. that do yeah. up tempo. Yeah. But, uh... Yeah, with this record, I mean, we would written, I think, 22 or 24 songs, and we were chatting to each other about what we wanted, and we thought, well, after the pandemic, this is our first record. Well, apart from the greatest hits, which was songs that people knew, this is our first new material. And some of the song was a bit more, some of the songs were a bit more down, a bit more melancholy and sad. And we thought, well, let's pick the ones that are energetic and have a bit more fight and a bit more focus. And the 10 that went on the album were those ones because we thought people have suffered enough. You know, if people are coming back to therapy for their first new material in five years since Cleve in 2018, and they put it on and we sound like we're really depressed. That's no, that's not really fair on people. They've suffered enough. So we, we we choose the 10, as we say, bangers, the ones with the melody and the ones with the hard-hitting riffs. And, and also our producer, Chris Sheldon, the guy that worked on this album, he's worked on some of our albums before. He helped choose, he agreed with us. You know, he listened to all the songs we had written during lockdown and he went, yeah, pick these 10, these ones are the best. Yeah, and the cool thing is, uh, my first therapy uh, concert ever was last year. Mm -hmm. I've I've listened to you for thirty years about about mm -hmm. thirty years, but it was my first live show of you uh, in Essen. If you remember, uh -huh. maybe. yes, so yes, really and uh, my girlfriend, she's a big fan of you as well, and she told me it was the best concert of last year she had, and wow. this is uh, for the energy, for the power you had uh, yeah. from the stage with the people. So I think all these new songs fit perfectly into such a set list as we had. Oh yeah, oh, thank you so much. That that means so much to me. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I um I enjoyed that show in Essen. I, I like Essen a lot, actually. And um it's uh these songs as well. That I mean the album's only 31 minutes long. So whenever we do play a show, 
we can play all of hard cold fire and then we can play another hour of about one hour and maybe more of stuff that people already know so it's really good so the, and also the as you say those songs like they shoot the terrible master and joy they fit in really well with some of therapy's established songs I don't remember the set list, uh, but how much of the new songs did you play last year? I'm not sure. We, we played two songs. We played Pineland of Hope and Glory and Joy with the two songs we played, yeah. yeah. Uh, and Joy is another song we should talk about because it was the first single, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the press info, there's always some sides of you telling something and uh, it sounds like uh, it's going about habits and you don't like habits that much. So maybe you can explain that. Well, well I think habits that make people that habits that have a negative effect on people. So negative, like habitually bad thinking, or um, if you do something which makes you unhappy, but you keep doing it. Um, if you're depressed, but you refuse to leave the house. And it's, it's something that's very, uh, it came from a Samuel Beckett quote in Waiting for Godot. He said, habit is a terrible deadener. And deadener was a word he used for things that's like repetition, repetition, repetition it deadens the senses. So it's a bit like if you do the same thing every day, after a while, your life doesn't have the same glow and energy. Now, I, actually for someone that's in a band called Therapy, I've only ever seen a therapist once. <laughs> and it was years and years ago. And it's just someone for, for some trauma that happened in my life. And I went to see him once. And the only thing I thought that was really useful was he asked me about my day. And I was like, oh, get up and I'd listen to some music and then kind of sit on the sofa and maybe watch a film and do, do it. And he said, well, when if you get up in the morning and you leave the house, when you go out your front door, what way do you go? And I said, always turn right because the, the town is turning up. He said, tomorrow morning when you go out of your house, turn left. And he said, it's, and if you do little things like that every day uh, and look for a little, and another thing he said was look for a little adventure. He said it doesn't take much to, to change the way that you think. And that has always stayed with me. So if I ever think that, you know, for example, during lockdown, when I was playing guitar every day, I was trying to come up with new ideas. And I realized that I've been playing rock music for so long. I, I listen to lots of kinds of music, but I always play along with electronic music and with metal and punk records to build up my, my chops. So uh, I was talking to a friend of mine in a band and uh, we were talking about the jazz guitarist, Wes Montgomery, who's amazing. And I thought, okay. So I ordered uh, a Wes Montgomery book online and thought I'll teach myself some, because I know nothing about jazz. I thought I'll teach myself some licks. And they're very, very difficult. I mean, he's an crazy, amazing, amazing guitar player. So I would play the riffs really slowly and then I would read the notation and I would work it out. But I found that it brightened my mood because it was a challenge. I set myself a challenge. Whenever I completed the challenge and I could play the, the lick or the riff, I, got, I felt really good about myself and I got an endorphin rush. And then it also meant that when I was writing some therapy songs too, they're certainly not jazz, but I looked at chords and guitars a different way. And that was just from buying a book. And it was little simple things like that. And also if things like in, in life, just... Um, maybe switching what kind of books you normally read or and uh, walking walking for different places. I mean, I've lived in Cambridge for 20 years and during the pandemic, myself and my wife decided to go places in Cambridge we'd never been because the streets were empty. <laughs> and we found, we found a lot of old buildings that we never even knew existed. Yeah, I understand. I think this is something I have for my life always, this curiosity and uh, always mm. searching for new challenges. That's why, for example, I am a journalist. I can ask people yeah. and all the input can be something that brings me to new new ways and new ideas and stuff. Yeah. That's that's the perfect word. You just used curiosity. That's perfect. Because yeah. uh, I think curiosity, they always say that when people get older and they, they have to keep their minds active and curiosity is the biggest thing. If they can learn new skills, even things like doing Sudoku, Or, you know, learning a new language, it keeps people mentally healthy and active to, for a very long time. And I think this is what makes people old. If uh, children, most children are curious, I would say, but mm -hmm. uh, people who are getting into their habits and doing only the stuff they always do, they lose their curiosity and they lose, uh, they get old, I think. It's, it's what makes you old, what makes you like, uh, yeah. 
I know I, I totally agree. And and I have friends of mine, I mean, I'm 57 years of age and I'll see friends of mine that don't work in the music business and we'll maybe have dinner and they'll go, you know, you're you're 57 year old man and you're on stage and you're playing is heavy metal and rock and punk, is that not a young person's music and you're shouting? And I'll go, well, yeah, but I never get into fights in bars or I never I never have to beat my wife or it because all my rage and all my anger, I have somewhere to put it. Yeah. And you, you might think it's ridiculous, but people at 57 years of age don't miraculously stop getting angry just because somebody works in a bank doesn't mean that all their problems have gone at 57, but they have nowhere to put those. And yeah, some people might take up squash or mountain climbing, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. So like, you know, my mountain climbing or squash or cycling or whatever is is being in a band. I think this is, uh, this is something where many problems in society come from, that people don't have a fo uh, channel for their anger, for getting their energy out and uh, they stay like yeah, and their habits and... Yeah, somehow. yeah, exactly. And part, I mean, it needs to go somewhere. I mean, it, it, and especially, especially to return again to what we said about the toxicity in the West, it needs to go somewhere, and it needs it needs to go somewhere positive where it can disappear. And you know, I like I like going to football matches, which is great. You know, myself and my wife explore quite a lot. You know, um, but it's, I think I'm so 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 grateful. That I'm able to do this after after so many years, 33, 34 years. Um, before we uh, go on, uh, Sam meant uh, you have twenty five. We have twenty five minutes, so we are on the limit. Will you have a date afterwards? So yes, uh, I've, I've got um, I've got somebody in uh, in Germany next. Yeah. Okay, so I think we will just do a final question because I have lots of notes here, but uh, nothing of this was asked now because we had a good talk. But the final question I want to ask. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just just a joke, but uh, which uh, which typical journalist question did you absolutely not miss in this interview? Why the question mark? <laughs> that that is the most asked question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That was cool. It was a nice talk. So thank you yeah, for that. Too. Yeah. And I hope we see you in a, on your next stint somewhere here when you're doing a show. I hope so. I'd like to see you. Yeah. Thank you. So have a nice evening and thanks for the talk and say bye to the people. I will do. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Take care.